So hello, today I'm at St James's Church in Denji in Essex. The Denji is a tiny village in Essex on the Denji Peninsula. It's got a population of just 116 people. The village is surrounded by farmland and wetlands. It's 14 metres above sea level. Now the village is centrally located on the peninsula with the River Crouch, the Blackwater and the North Sea flanking the three sides. Now history, like its adjoining neighbour of Asheldham, dates back to the Neolithic period. We would have saber-toothed tigers and porcupine here, which would have been hunted 7,500 BC. Incredible age. Nearby Asheldham also had an Iron Age fortification, so it's literally walking distance from here. So it's highly likely a community formed this area. Archaeological evidence indicates the area was open grassland with tree cover and field patterns have changed very little. And if I pan this, uh, this camera around, you can still see that the fields are all over the place. Morning. Also, the road system uh, that's set out is also dating back to the Iron Age. So since the Roman period, sheep were grazing here. When a contemporary noted, an abundance multitude of gentle beasts laden with fleeces. And they were his words from the Roman period. And it turns out that the salt marsh pasture makes excellent grazing land. And I've noted that other communities in Corringham, Tilbury, Fobbing and Bradwell on Sea, which are all in Essex, also rear sheep, or at least did in those times. Now Malden District Council conducted a report on the Denji Peninsula and it was likely that Denji villagers would have been involved in salt production and there were red hills not far from here located east and southeast and they indicate an industry that continued long into the Roman period and beyond. Now salt was highly prized and exported. A further industry connected to the area was oysters, much prized by the Romans again and they would have been packed into barrels and they would have used local salt, probably from Malden. And this salt is still being sold today and you can buy it from the town if you visit Malden. Highly recommended. These barrels were shipped off to the Roman Empire You can still get oysters from around this area at Burnham on Crouch, which is not so far from here. A Saxon settlement followed here. Some, uh, some of the industries that would have carried on connection with oysters, salt and sheep. Now at some point there was a Saxon fane called Witchbricht and he was Lord of the Manor here. And the lane uh, and the land itself was known as Witch Brickturn. And that was until the Danish Vikings ruled this land under Guthrum, the Viking Sea King. And this was from around 878. But a decade before this, I'll oh, set his van pass. A decade before, we have a, um, a ruler here, or a Viking, called Ivan the Boneless. You see the wind farm in the background there. So Ivan the Boneless was here and he was raiding this area. Now under the Viking rule, Denji was known as 
Danes Ig, which means Danes Island. And after eight years, the Saxon rule returned. From 1016, the Vikings ruled once again, this time under Canute the Great. And Canute would have the manor here at Southminster, not far from here, literally miles away. So he could have possibly been at this very spot I'm standing. Again, it was sheep that pro provided the wealth for Canute the Great. Now we know that in 1066, Fortkill and Cyric owned the lordships here. And by the time of the Norman Doomsday Book of 1086, a detailed account of life here was written. The Abbey of St. Valley had become the tenant in chief of one of the manors and Bishop Odo of Bayeux, who was the half-brother of William the Conqueror himself, he owned the other. There were 360 sheep that grazed this land. There were plough teams and there were small settlements of six villages. There were six free men and there were 14 freeholders and seven slaves. So a fairly busy community. The two manor houses here, or two manors, were called Bacon's and Denji. Now, being, now Bacon's itself is half a mile north of St. James. So north is basically, right, yeah, so north is basically the other side of the church. Not sure if it's connected with that house there. Could well be. And yes, it's half a mile north and it belonged to the Abbey of St. Valley of Picardy in France. Now Gilbert Bacon, from whom it got its name in 1282, and that year obtained a license from a man called Henry de Crevalli, who was Lord of the Manor, and he had the right to build a free chapel here. And so the manor of Bacon was passed from lord to lord. For example, a Lord Dorward held a court here on the 22nd of February, 13. 60, 1399 and by 1559 court was still being held here twice every year we know that around this time there was the lord of the manor was ruled by sir ambrose by 1612 so that's like eight years before the mayflower sailed we know that a Sir Thomas Springway of Springfield near Chelmsford held the title and he also owned lands in Southminster, Tillingham and Esheldham so he would have been a powerful landowner here. This church of St James at that time was held by, was actually owned in part by the um, Lords of the Manor at Bacon's Manor. They were patrons of the church. Big bangs in the background. Now when I research the names that are involved in the patronage of this church and the ownership in part. I found an R. Cromwell of March 1658. This may well have been Oliver Cromwell's son, who was called Richard. Now Oliver Cromwell himself died in the same year of 1658. Position that on there. Oliver Cromwell, by coincidence, also had his fleet built at nearby Malden. So did his son 
Richard have the ownership here in part or was he living here? We don't know. I did contact the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon. They weren't able to confirm this. And this is where the information ends. I've not been able to find out any further information. But we can now focus on the church itself. So the church itself is 14th century and the walls are built of septaria, flint and pebble rubble from the local fields. There's some Roman brick and limestone dressings. So on the outside, we have the First World War Memorial. And if you look how many names are there, considering this is a very small village indeed. And just beneath that, you can barely see, there's the Second World War. Looks like two guys as well. So the First World War must have been devastating for this village. Now, the nave, which is the large building in front of us, is 40 foot, 45 feet by 18 feet. It's going to close up there. Yeah. So if we go around to the west side, We've got the original window. You can see how it's stone has perished. So this window is described as being three trefoiled ogi lights with ogi heads which have perished. This is the original 14th century doorway. And you can see how they've used stonework or stone. Massive flints here. And smack that in half to get more out of it. If you look at the top, ah, come around here a little bit. If you look up there, three immense lion heads, which would come date from the 19th century. And then you've got an external bell cradle with the two bells. And it's a beautiful part of the country, very quiet. And here I see a mark I got a feeling this is the cornerstone that they used for surveying when they built, when they renovated this. In front of us we've got a, what they describe as a modern porch, which would be 19th century. And you can see how the heads are weathered. Sadly, the porch, is, the church itself, is not open. But we can have a look in. The, oh, we can have a look in the porch itself. It's almost like a um, notice board here give the parishioners information and then it looks like Community Council of Essex best kept churchyard competition so it's won it a few times which is good that's nice sun's coming back out it's a glorious day today, it's almost 18 degrees. 
I've noticed they've got some unusual yellow type stone here which I've not seen before so it must be some sort of local stone brick perhaps now we're on to the chancel now this is 26 feet by 16 feet again it'll be 14th century but under heavy renovations You can see how the limestone corrodes and just flakes off here. And I guess inside this would be a really nice window. Couldn't tell you what it is. Oh, it's Jesus, and I presume it's Jesus. Not sure. Massive flints here. I say bigger than I've seen in other parts. This is good for building material. And uh, these flowers are coming out. I couldn't tell you what they're called. And if we go on to the east wall. And this is a vestry here, which is described as being modern. Now, there are two bells, which you can just about see, I zoom right in. So they're fully exposed to the elements. Now, if I told you that one of the bells was by Thomas Bullisdon, 1500, and it's inscribed Sancta or Santa Maria Ora Pro Nobis, which in Latin translates to Holy Mary Pray for Us Sinners. Now Thomas was a master bell founder of the world famous Whitechapel Bell Foundry in London and he cast bells for 15 years. So you can imagine them carting these bells up the rickety lanes or perhaps by barge maybe, who knows. Also some unusual holes there, I don't know what they're for maybe been used from a previous building. Now we're on the north wall, this has been blocked up. This would probably be the original priest door. It's quite a big priest door actually. It's probably two meters tall. Now the second bell, which in Latin reads, Sir Thomas Maurice Vecchery, which I couldn't find an exact translation, but I think it relates to Sir Thomas More, who was Henry VIII's Lord High Chancellor of England, who was executed in 1535 at Tower Hill, Tower of London. You can see these yellow bricks. And something was here before, you can see it's been opened up or blocked up. And it looks like it's surrounded by farm the farm now. Now the bell turret on top was rebuilt in 1849 so that gives you an indication of when this is restored. It's very popular around here for, for cyclists actually I've noticed and you can see it's quite a flat area and the traffic's virtually minimal, so you can understand that. It's well worth coming to the Denji Peninsula. I did read that it's actually the most 
isolated part of England. It's quite incredible. So from my town in Billericay, this is 18 miles. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much.